First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, is this the Dynamo Motorcycle Company? Yes, it is. How can I help you? Well, I have an instruction manual here for your new electric motorcycle, but I'm not satisfied with the purchase at all. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. But don't worry, I'm sure we can sort this out. Before we do anything, can you tell me the model number? Ah, at the top of the instruction manual here it gives the model number RTY34. Uh, TY34. OK. Now, what's the nature of your complaint? It's many things, actually. The biggest problem is that you say in your manual that the battery will take the motorcycle 30 kilometres. That's right. Well, it's lucky to take me eight. The battery is usually flat by then, often leaving me stuck at the side of the road. Are you sure you're charging it correctly? I'm fairly sure. I follow all the instructions and plug it in for a long time. And are you sure you charge it for the required three hours? I charge it until the charging light goes off, and that's two hours, so that should be enough. And there's a serious design fault with this motorcycle. When you're riding it, there's no meter to show you how much power is left, so you actually don't know when the machine is going to stop working. There's a voltage gauge. Yes, but that tells you nothing. The needle fluctuates about from 55 to 45, so whatever it says is meaningless. According to the manual, you're meant to charge the battery if the needle falls under 50 volts. But even when you charge it, it can go below 45. As I said, the needle just waves all over the place. The result is that I'm always worried that the bike will leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sure, but what are you going to do about it? Unfortunately, we don't have a refund policy. But if you take the bike to one of our shops, our mechanics will look at it. Perhaps there's a problem that we can fix. The gauge, for example. The other problem is the battery. I actually weighed it, and it's almost six kilograms. Yet you say in your manual that it weighs only three. I can barely pick the thing up, so it's not three kilograms at all. Maybe you purchased the wrong model by mistake. I doubt that very much. Basically, I think I've been defrauded, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about it. All right, I'll put you through to our complaints department. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Hello? Complaints department here. Uh, apparently you have a complaint? Yes, I do. Let me tell you all about... It's, it's all right. Our representative has already informed me about your problem. It's probably just a misunderstanding. I'm sure we can work something out. Right now, I need to take down some details. All right. Can I have your name, please? Jesse Parkinson. That's J E double -S, S I E and Parkinson, P A R K I N S O N. Parkinson. All right. What shall we list this complaint under? Parts, service, or performance? Well, the meter isn't accurate at all, so that's parts, isn't it? Yes, perhaps, but you do feel more generally that the motorcycle doesn't meet the operational standards as advertised, so it's probably better to tick performance here. Can we tick both, parts and performance? 
No, we can only tick one, so let's not call it parts. We'll go with performance. Now, we may post some further forms and questionnaires to you, so would you mind giving me your address? Certainly, it's 45 Melrose Road. Melrose, M-E-L and Rose. OK, now, your phone number? Just use my mobile phone. That's 0928982. Four five three. Four five three. Okay. And if we have any follow-up questions, what time is best for ringing you? Morning, afternoon, night time. Well, I work as a secretary from nine to five, but I do get a lunch break, which gives me some free time. This break used to be twelve thirty to one thirty, but then it changed to an hour later. So it's best to ring me at two p.m. since the break now starts at one thirty. Right. Uh, that's all for now. We just need to do our own investigation, and we'll probably ring you back tomorrow. I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainee teacher called Eve talking to her university tutor about her preparations for teaching practice. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Eve. Come in and sit down. How's it going? Fine, thanks. I'm looking forward to my teaching practice next week. Good. Now, you've got two classes, haven't you? Year 3 and Year 6. Have you done your lesson plans? Well, I've decided to take the topic of renewable energy... I haven't done a lesson plan for Year 6 yet, but I thought I'd base their lesson on an example of very simple technology. So, I've brought this diagram to show you. I got it from the internet. Let's see. A biogas plant. So, this is equipment for producing fuel from organic waste? Yes. The smaller container on the left is where you put the waste you've collected. Right, and from there it's piped into the larger tank. That's right, and that slurry on the base of the larger tank. Right, and what exactly is slurry? It's a mixture of organic waste and water. So is that pipe at the bottom where the water comes in? Yes, it is. As the slurry mixture digests, it produces gas, and that rises to the top of the dome. Then, when it's needed, it can be piped off for use as fuel in homes or factories. It's very simple. I suppose there's some kind of safety valve to prevent pressure build-up? That's the overflow tank. That container on the right. As the slurry expands, some of it flows into that, and then once some of the gas has been piped off, the slurry level goes down again, and the overflow tank empties again. I see. Well, I think that's suitably simple for the age level it's for. I look forward to seeing the whole lesson plan. Thanks. And can I show you my ideas for the Year 3 lesson? Of course. Let's... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I thought I'd introduce the topic by writing the word energy on the board and reinforcing the spelling and the pronunciation. Then I'll do a little mime, you know, run on the spot or something, to convey the sense. I'd keep it brief at this stage. Yes, I will. Then I'll wipe the word off and write the question, where does energy come from, and see what the pupils come up with. Fine. I'd suggest that you just brainstorm at this stage and don't reject any of their suggestions. Yes, that's what I was going to do. Then I've produced a set of simple statements like energy makes cars move along the road and energy makes our bodies grow. There are eight altogether. Are you going to give them out as a handout or write them up on the board? First, write them up on the board and then I'll read them out loud and I'll get the pupils to copy them out in their notebooks. I'll also ask them to think up one more similar statement by themselves and add it to the list. Good idea. After that, I thought I'd vary things a bit by sticking some pictures up, of things like the sun and plants and food, and petrol and a running child, and I'll get the pupils to work out what order the pictures should come in, in terms of the energy chain. I think that's a very good idea. You could move the pictures around as the pupils give you directions. Yes, I think they'd enjoy that. And to finish off, I've made a gap fill exercise to give out. They'll be doing that individually, and while they're writing, I'll walk round and check their work. Good. And have you worked out the timing of all that? It'll probably take you right through to the end of the lesson. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part 3. You will hear a student union officer's speech. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi there. May I wish you a very warm welcome to Ealing College, and more especially to the Student Union. The Student Union is run by four sabbatical officers, of which I am one. As the President, I am charged with the overall day-to-day -day running of the Union itself, according to established policies within the Constitution. We also have a brilliant staff team who'll help us, and you'll meet them when you have five minutes to drop in and see us. The last year has seen the student union grow from incorporating a bar and a few offices with a small shop into being a thriving concern, which controls, to its credit, two bars, a cafe bar or restaurant, a shop, a comprehensive welfare department, and numerous offices. All this has been achieved by sheer hard work and dedication on the part of last year's sabbatical team and staff, who overcame many obstacles and teething problems, but won through in the end. This year, our aims as a team will be to consolidate on what has already been achieved and to secure the future of the Union. With the new post of Vice President Social and Communications, our main emphasis will be on communications within the College which has always proved a problem in the past, but one which we hope to improve upon this year. One way will be the regular publication of a student union magazine, so all you budding journalists come on down. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We are very aware that a lot of you have never had any contact with student unions before and don't know what they are or what they can do for you. So basically, here's a quick rundown. If you have any problems at all, either when you start college or throughout your time here, don't hesitate to drop in in the SU office in the North Building and see Pat, our office assistant. She will be able to help you with most of your day-to-day -day general inquiries, or if she can't, she will direct you to one of our staff who can. Myself and the other three vice presidents are here every day, and if you need to see us, just fix a time with Pat, and we'll be only too happy to help you. By the way, queries or problems can range from a late grant check finding a place to live and academic matters, right through to the best places to eat, directions to the bar, or somebody blocking you in the car park. We'll give anything our best shot. Please remember, while you're at Ealing, that going to college is not just about education. Make sure you enjoy yourself as well, because believe me, time will fly once you're here. Ealing is a really good place to live, as there is lots to see and do. And don't forget, the metropolis of central London is only 20 minutes away by tube. Finally, the Student Union is an organisation run by students for students. So if there is anything you don't agree with, or you have any new ideas, please come along to the Union General Meetings, and don't be afraid to speak up. Or, you could give up a little of your time and stand for the Executive Committee which is made up of students who help us out with lots of interesting things. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the sabbaticals of the last two years who have worked so hard. My very special thanks goes to Winston, Martin and Peter and all the staff who not only did a great job but have been my good friends as well. Lots of luck and success for your year at Ealing. Work hard, but play hard as well. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Dr Carey, who will talk about the programme in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications. 
and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student, Edmund Mukala, from the Congo, came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from eight different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of parks development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. That is the end of part four.